We are glad you're here to help us this day to celebrate the resurrection. I chose for the title of today's message to be the surprise of the resurrection. And I hope after we look at the seven occasions at least where there was definitely surprise in the resurrection narrative, you can join me in saying that it takes a simple faith to experience this surprise of resurrection. Go with me to the Gospel of John, writing as all four evangelists did, reporting their unique look at the resurrection. John writing, of course, later, bringing to the forefront many of the things that the synoptics did not bring to us, those first three, and enabling us to see even deeper into the mystery and the majesty of God revealing the great love that he has. It was a glory. It was a presence of God in Christ, loving a world that did not even understand its own sinful self. So read with the beginning in verse 1 of John chapter 20. It was early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She left with concern wondering how she could gain entrance. But once she saw that the stone had been rolled away, she became alarmed. This took her in flight to Peter. The scripture says that she ran to tell Peter and the others, and Peter and John, of course, we know he is the disciple that the Lord loves as he cloaks his own name in this gospel account. They take off, and of course, John's younger, and John's faster, so he beats Peter to the tomb. He is also of a different disposition. He realized when he approached the tomb that was empty, there was something holy about that place. And he stopped. And he didn't go in. Much like when Moses realized that the bush that was burning was on holy ground. He took off his shoes from his feet and fell on his face before God. John stands there. And then the reason you and I like Peter is because we're like him. He just rambles right on in. He doesn't see holy. He doesn't see a tomb. He just wants to know what's going on and what he needs to do to advance the cause. So bursting into that scene, he realizes the body's not there. But then John stops in this gospel account to remind us and to remind the church that's almost 100 years in existence now when these writings are being compiled that there were some things you need to watch. Nothing had been disturbed. If it had been a thief, they could have cared less about the carnage left. Everything was neat and folded. There was no hurry. There was no rush. He remembers all of this and he could perceive this because the scripture tells us that once he looked in, he believed. Do you realize the first person to believe in the resurrection was John? And the first person to experience the resurrected Christ was Mary. Mary thought Jesus was a gardener. The scripture says there as we turn the page that she actually asked him, where have you put the Lord? I'll get him. And then that word, that word I hope that you've heard, I've certainly heard it, when Jesus calls your name and he said, Mary. I don't mean just to verbally utter your name, but when he speaks to the very center of your person. And when Jesus said that, Mary realized it was the teacher, Rabboni, she responded. And of course he said, release me and let me go. I've not ascended to the Father, but you go. And we go to the other narratives to know what she had to go with. She went to tell them what? To go to that place that was pre-designed by Jesus and I'll meet you there. So Mary went to the disciples with the news. 
I have seen the Lord. Now that's not just a Baptist and a Southerner making a loud comment. <laughs> if you read the text, there is an exclamation point at the end of that sentence, which means that you ought to have some gumption and enthusiasm when you make that statement. But I promise you, if you've ever heard the Lord call your name, you have that when you speak about the surprise of what God has done in your life and mine because of the resurrected Lord. Join me as we pray this morning. Father, thank you for the surprise of the resurrection. Lord, as we look at these seven occurrences, these things that are part of the text, we learn about how that resurrection is crafted and caricatured by insight and comment and occurrence. Lord, help that to inform us about how we can grasp yet again on this Easter the surprise of the resurrection. I ask that in and through Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Now, if you're visiting with us and you have a worship guide and you've picked it up and you realize, oh my goodness, seven points, <laughs> ten scripture references, I see all those red things in that preacher's Bible. <laughs> and it's, what time? <laughs> Y'all not worried about time, are you? We're going to eat when this is over, right? I got accused of rushing this morning, which may be the best good news you got today from me. Uh, but I want you to journey with me at some of these surprises. And let's first look at where resurrection began. Now, you might think that resurrection began at the tomb, but friend, resurrection began at Golgotha. Resurrection began when the cross was finished. When Jesus announced in his final breath, to tell us die, he said it's been paid in full. Now, he has had the full command of the power of God since chapter 13, where the scripture informs us in John's gospel that all power of the Father has been given to the Son. And he goes through all of this horrible, horrible behavior and treatment for just one reason, because he's loved you and I to the uttermost. Now, you got to get that word, uttermost. It means to love to the end. It means to love absolutely. And when you love to the end absolutely, that means, folks, no matter what's on your plate or mine, in the history or the future of our life, God never gives up on us. That's a surprise for most of us. If you came this morning wanting some hope, leave with resurrection hope and be surprised by the love of God. I can tell you that thief on the cross was surprised when Jesus said today, you'll be with me in paradise. I'm thinking he's over there saying, me? I'm going to be in paradise with the likes of you? Surprise. It's finished. When Jesus announced this, surprising things begin to happen at the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, when he spoke these words, Scripture tells us that the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. And sin, which separated man from holy God, had been remedied and we had access into his presence for the first time since the garden through the blood of Jesus. Oh, folks, we need to be surprised about that, Amen. that God would love us so much that he would give his one and only son that if we would just simply confess our sin and take him as Lord and Savior, he would give us his presence again. We talked in our Sunday school lessons this morning about what does the de resurrection make as a difference in your life? And one of the first things the lady on the front row said is peace. And she didn't just say peace. She says, I know peace. Yes. Do you know peace today that is the result of the surprise of the resurrection? I hope so. So the curtain is torn. And then creation begins 
just her. You know, it's like a woman that's pregnant and she's at those last moments and it's been that, ladies, that you, you've had babies, it's been that terrible long nine months and finally, everything, the pains, every, it, th this is it. You may have woken your husband or you may have had to get in the car and drive yourself or you're thinking, oh my goodness. It was that moment. Creation began to stir. In fact, it says that there was an earthquake and it shook the whole place. So what happened? What was the surprise? They were surprised at the Jewish temple as they were waiting on all this mess to be over so they could celebrate the Passover. But the Holy of Holies is exposed and the earth is beginning to quake. And at the same time, do you realize that the greatest words that man has ever heard came from a cemetery? He's risen. But I'll tell you what came out of that cemetery before that was said <laughs> was some dead folks. Now tell me the truth. If you drove by a graveyard today and there were people standing in front of their tombstones that were in those graves, would you be surprised? Don't think that Jerusalem was not surprised when they saw some dead folks walking around that they had just recently put in the grave. There was some surprise because of the resurrection. And just as at Golgotha in finishing the work that God had designed and completed by Jesus and the temple incident, I want to tell you, there was no place, I don't believe, that was more surprised than hell. Because when Jesus died, you all know the Apostles' Creed. It talks about that we believe in the God the Father Almighty, that he was born, that he lived, he suffered. And then it says he what? Went down into hell. What must it have been like for Satan and the demons of heaven when Jesus showed up at the gates of hell? You see, folks, he, he didn't have to ask permission. They couldn't open the gates and reach out and get him. In fact, Jesus transcends that gate and the gates of hell cannot stand against him and his power and on that resurrection day, Jesus entered hell and he preached good news to the captives. And I've got to believe that's got to be one of the greatest evangelistic responses that ever happened. If I were in hell, I would definitely say yes, wouldn't you? <laughs> the Spirit of God in the prophets had been preaching this good news and Jesus went there to lead captivity captive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... There are those messages about hell. Uh, death couldn't keep him. And the devil couldn't stop him. And he's made life everlasting possible for you and for me. From Golgotha surprise to the temple surprise to the hellish surprise comes the one that we're here to celebrate today, the surprise of the tomb. When John got to the tomb, if nobody else got it, John did. He knew it was a holy place. He knew something supernatural and eternal had taken place. And so he stopped. Have you noticed we live in a world that no longer stops for holy things? They don't even recognize them. When a prayer is said, I was so pleased today as I stood on the pier during our sunrise service. A man with all of his fishing rods and the lady and the individual was with him. They walked right up to where all the, I mean, y'all don't realize this is going on when you're the person up there doing it. All these people fishing are walking in behind you while you're trying to have a sunrise service. It is distracting and this person got right up to where we were and they stopped. And they stayed there through that long prayer that Bob prayed. <laughs> Bob, which I thought made, you know, your prayer was great, but it was long. <laughs> it was almost as long as his sermon. <laughs> and when he said amen, I turned around and I said, thank you for your respect for God's prayer and God's word. And he went right on out on the end of that pier to fish. 
It's not that everybody misses it, but it's a novelty these days for people to respect holy things. And John respected the holiness of the tomb. And because he did, he saw things there that none of the other evangelists were aware of and no one else reports to us. There is unique information in John's gospel about the resurrection which enriches Easter Sunday morning for us. Jesus wasn't in a hurry. He didn't need anybody to roll the stone back. He was already out. They just rolled it back so we could see in. You see, it was us and the surprise of an empty tomb that needed that information. And John just wanted us to know. I know you've got questions about this, but hey, let me tell you what I saw. There was an angel sitting at one end and at the other so that all of these simple but very profound things could be guarded. Well, we move from the tomb to the room. Disciples still haven't got it, even though Peter has gone back and announced and it's that evening and they're meeting in that room and they're locked in and locked everybody else out and they're terrified. Have you ever been scared? Have you ever confined yourself in the midst of your fear? Well, you know, that could be both physically and psychologically as well as spiritually. We have a tendency when we get afraid to isolate to protect and put up walls. And in the midst of their fear and their doubt, Jesus just appears. He didn't knock on the door. He didn't climb in the window. He didn't slide down the chimney. I don't even know they have chimneys over there. <laughs> he just appeared. Do you think they were surprised? Oh, yeah. They were surprised. Oh, God longs to surprise us on this Easter Sunday with the resurrection and its truths and they were in that room and the suddenness of his appearance surprised them. Even John. Because you see, the Jesus they knew just hours earlier could not do that. He was limited to his historical existence but he was no longer the historical Lamb of God. He is now the King of kings and the Lord of lords and at will he could be there or not be there. He could appear or not appear. Amen. And you say, well, pastor, how do you know that? Well, go to the next point. Go to the road. Two of those guys were walking down the road. And they were talking. And Jesus comes and joins them. And they think he's a stranger. Jesus ever show up in your journey and you miss that he's there until it's painfully aware that he's there? And they begin to talk to him about how could you live in this place? How could you come to this area and not know what's been going on? Everybody knows it. And hundreds of thousands of people knew it. But then he begins to talk to them about their own lack of information. Do you enjoy being called ignorant? I'm always God. I'm always glad God has a gentle way of bringing you to your ignorance. He does that to me quite often. And these two guys who had been with him all this time begin to hear this stranger tell them about the fulfillment of all of the prophecies of the Old Testament that are the result of this resurrection that they should have known and wonders, why don't you know this? And they're so interested in this person as they go on the road to Emmaus that when they get there, they ask him to stay. He eats with him. Now, that's very important to me. In the resurrected state, we're going to be able to eat. Any of y'all like to eat? Uh. You know? And the best part is, I won't get fat anymore when they eat. I can go home and eat every one of those big old egg things we got and all that candy and chocolate and, you know, and, and then I can have cake. I, mean, I can do all that, plus eat the, the major meal. I have a, a church member that's bringing me a leg of lamb today. Woo, I love her. I would love y'all just as much if y'all do some stuff like that for me. But, you know, she, she's bringing me a leg of lamb and, and she knows the preacher likes that. And I said, bring it late. I don't want anybody to have it but me. We're having our lunch with the family and I'm going to put that aside for supper. I can just eat and I will get, you know, it's, well, he, he came and 
he sat down, he began to eat, and, and then you remember what happened? He, like the scales that fell from the eyes of Saul after the Damascus Road experience, the Scripture says that he opened their eyes so that they could see, and it was the Christ. And then they reflected, did our hearts not burn within us? Ah, you know, that's what those... Any of y'all been on the Emmaus Walk? In different traditions, it's got different names. It's a, it's a time to rekindle your spiritual relationship with God. It's a time when they try to help you to allow your relationship with the Lord to burn again in your soul by going back and reclaiming things that you've missed and bringing them back to life. I mean, it's a great concept. And this is where it comes from. Because their hearts burned within them. Jesus was so close and the things he said were so powerful that they just believed, how could this be? I mean, we've never met anybody that was like this except Jesus only to find out it was. You say, well, Pastor, that can't happen to me. If you believe the Bible, it does say you may be entertaining angels, what? Unaware, and they're always coming with a message from God. Ooh, the surprise. Of the resurrection on the room in the road and then finally at the house one of the guys was not there we mistreat him terribly we call him doubting see you know who I'm talking about we call him doubting Thomas they tell about all that has happened they give all these post-resurrection experiences in narrative to him. And he says, I'll not believe unless I see the marks in his hand and his feet and the piercing in his side. I'll not believe that stuff. But you know what we don't pick up? When he walks into Jesus' presence and Jesus offers the physical evidence for him to believe, what does Thomas say? Something more than you and I probably would say. My Lord and my God never says he touched him. He knew just by seeing him, the surprise of the resurrection was a reality. So it takes simple faith, folks, for us to experience the surprise of the resurrection. Well, I want to close with Miranda Gillian's story. Does anybody in here that wasn't in the first service you're in the first service, you already know. Does anybody know her story? Well, you may not know her. She's four years old. And on Wednesday, which I typically do on Wednesday, I had my time with our day school children. And, of course, the topic is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That is not easy to explain to children two to five years old. Well, maybe you could, but I was at loss. And so I'm thinking, well, how am I going to do this? And, you know, I can give them data. I mean, I can tell them the story, and I started into that, and and, and I got into my story, and, and I finally got to the part that's the hardest is, you know, how do you explain the resurrection to a four-year-old? And I said, do any of y'all know what the resurrection is? And this little girl, she is precious. Dark complected, jet black hair, just eyes that look like they're light bulbs almost. And she sits right up on her knees from the sitting position she was in when I asked the question. And she said, when Jesus came alive again. And I said, I'm going to use that, honey, on Sunday morning." Do you know what that, that is the surprise from childlike faith to give fact to the resurrection. It's when Jesus came alive again. The songwriter said, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose the victor from the where? Hell, dark's domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. 
Are you surprised today? I hope so. I hope so. Stand with me if you will. Father, today we thank you for the surprise of the resurrection and all of its narrative forms. We thank you for each evangelist and how you inspired them, Father, to write all those things we needed to hear 2,000 years later. And we thank you for how you can bring it into the present reality of our life and continue to surprise us. Father, there is that person who needs to be surprised today by the saving work of Christ in their life, asking for forgiveness of sin and taking you as the resurrected Lord and Savior of their life. And there's those of us who are locked up, locked in, and scared in all the different ways in our life that need the surprise of the resurrection to set us free today. But whatever the need, Father, you take us warts and all just like we are. You take us, Father, just like we are. And that should surprise us. We don't deserve it. We cannot earn it. But you graciously give it. Surprise us today. And fill us with resurrection hope. In Jesus' name, amen.